Good morning, Chairman Olson, members of the commission, <laughs> Secretary Vonk. Uh, Jason Sorensen, our fish biologist and Chamberlain, actually put this presentation together. Uh, he's currently chucking musky baits in northern Minnesota, so I'm here to give you an update on our Francis Case paddlefish snagging season. Uh, I'm going to go over a little bit about some of the things you've heard in the past, kind of how we got to this point where we uh, have this Lake Francis Case paddlefish season. Uh, I'll also give you a summary of some of the season statistics that we, that we have. Uh, it's really basic stuff. Um, uh, and then also just a little bit on the future of this paddlefish season on Lake Francis Case. So a little bit about the history. Uh, the Missouri River has historically had uh, really good populations of paddlefish. They're extremely migratory uh, species, so they've used the Missouri River corridor, uh, oftentimes making uh, traveling hundreds of miles up the river. Uh, once we dammed the river, uh, it wasn't too long before we had this sport fishery develop right below Big Bend Dam. Um, the dams altered the flow, the temperature, uh, all kinds of different water characteristics in the Missouri River, so that altered the paddlefish migrations and, and what was happening with these paddlefish populations. Uh, we, once the dams were put in, we don't really have any reproduction in any of our reservoirs. Uh, Lewis and Clark Lake would probably be the, the closest to a, a, a reservoir that would allow for paddlefish production with some of that uh, delta type habitat in the upper end, the Niobrara River, some of those areas. So we don't really have any recruitment of these fish into the population in, in Lake Francis Case. They're, they're trying to spawn, they're, they may even you know spit eggs out, but they're just not uh, recruiting or, or coming into the population. So we, and we've developed these similar uh, tailwater fisheries below Gavin's Point, uh, and, and there's, there's a few paddlefish below a lot of these dams. And we closed this fishery in 1986 due to some of these reasons. So we started this artificial propagation uh, program where we were out uh, capturing paddlefish at the beginning of the, the spring and uh, taking them to the hatchery and uh, hatching them and putting them back into this reservoir. And the main uh, objectives of this was to increase the abundance which would help maintain a brood source in Lake Francis Case, so we would have these fish on hand for if we needed them in the future. And also, one of the initial goals was to develop a sport fishery in the future. So we started stocking paddlefish from 1974 on, and we did it intermittently. We, you know, we kind of did some different things to try and see what would work and what and what didn't. Uh, we initially started with fry and fingerling stocking, so we, we put out, you know, basically freshly hatched paddlefish that were really small at the beginning. That's the, the cheapest method of stocking and the easiest way to rear them. Uh, we tried some fingerling stuff where we grew them up a little larger. And uh, from 1990 on, we uh, stocked Lake Francis Case on an annual basis, and we basically established that advanced fingerlings are these larger uh, you can see them here in the picture. These larger fingerlings were the best method for getting these fish to recruit into the population. So like I said, the, the early fry and fingerling stockings, they weren't that successful, so we kind of modified what we were doing. Advanced fingerling stockings are what we've been using to maintain this population over time, and there's basically no natural recruitment in Lake Francis Case. <clears throat> so why did we want to establish this Francis Case paddle fish season? Uh, it, it's an additional opportunity. The fish are there. We've got this resource, and we would like to provide that to this opportunity to uh, anglers and sportsmen in South Dakota. It's a, it's a really unique opportunity. And to be honest, we've spent a lot of time and, and sportsmen's dollars on this uh, propagation deal on Lake Francis Case over time, so we want to be able to give something back to, to those people who've helped fund this. So we developed this uh, snagging season this la over this last couple years, uh, 400 total permits. We had 350 which were going to South Dakota residents. We had an allotment for the two tribes that are affiliated with Lake Francis Case. Uh, it's a spring season, so it's a little different than our Gavin's Point season, which is a fall, October season. The hours were 6 a.m. to 9 p.m., and we had similar regulations to Gavin's Point Dam. 
and this is uh, reservoir wide, and the majority of the activity would have been right here in the tail race, and then also here at the mouth of the White River. Those are the two major congregations where these fish become susceptible in the spring to, to snagging. Uh, now the first thing that everybody wants to do when we look at the information that we collected from this uh, snagging season is to compare it with the Gavin's Point season, which it's not really the best comparison. We had we have 16 over 1,600 tags down on below Gavin's Point Dam. We have 400 or 350 for the state uh, uh, at this Fr Lake Francis Case season. So these aren't the best comparisons in the world, but they give you an idea of the difference between the two fisheries. So the angling effort for this Lake Francis Case season this. Uh, through the month of May was 32, approximately 3,200 angler hours. And just to give the Gavin's Point statistic, uh, throughout the past uh, few years, we've had between 10,000 and 15,000 angler hours uh, below Gavin's Point for that season. The paddlefish catch rate, uh, snaggers caught an average of one fish every four and a half hours, so that catch rate was just over 0.2 for this uh, first year of the Lake Francis case paddlefish season. And this is one of the, one of the statistics that anglers were, you know, they had expectations at the beginning of this season. There was a lot of talk about the huge paddlefish that are in Francis case. So there was talk of breaking the state record. Um, you know, they also had these expectations from fishing this Gavin's Point season that their catch rates were going to be, you know, fairly high. Gavin's Point catch rates are generally around one fish an hour, so that's pretty high. Um, it ended up being around 0.2, so we did hear some, some anglers that weren't uh, overly happy with the, the lower catch rates, but, you know, this, these uh, areas where these fish congregate on Francis Case, they aren't as, as defined as down below Gavin's Point Dam, and they aren't as susceptible. The White River is kind of a, an interesting area to try and snag one of these fish. So you really have to know what you're doing to, to get that catch rate up there. And as I'll show you later, it wasn't impossible to do that. So the paddlefish harvest, uh, it was around, let's see, it was 145 paddlefish out of the 350 tags that, that we distributed. So we had a 41% success rate and the average fish was 44 pounds. If we take out the anglers who didn't fish, the success rate jumps to just under 50%. So of those anglers that fish, there's about half of them that harvested a fish. And to compare that with Gavin's Point Dam, it's generally 60 to 70% that, that uh, success rate. And when you take out the anglers that don't fish, it's 70 to 80%. So it is a little bit different fishery. Paddlefish that were caught and released. The anglers released nearly 600 paddlefish, so that's not too bad for, uh, or approximately 600 paddlefish for 350 tags. And once again, to, just to put it in perspective with Gavin's Point, they released between 10,000 and 15,000 paddlefish on an annual season there. Here's the length frequency for the harvested paddlefish. Uh, you can see those two bars on that graph, we got the length on the bottom and then the number on the left here. We've got the 35 inch mark and the 45 inch mark. So you see there's a lot of fish in between there. And there was a few fish that were over, over 45 and up into the 50 inch range. So there was some pretty nice fish taken during this, during this season. Uh, we did get a little bit of information back from the Lower Bruce Brule Sioux Tribe and their uh, 25 tags that they had allotted. And I guess I'll explain this picture too before we go on. The state record is 120 pounds. And I don't know if you've seen this in a previous presentation, but um, these are some of the grad students that did our, the project at SDSU working on the paddlefish population that helped us get to this point where we knew that we were going to be able to have a snag fishery. So these guys were very important in, in how we arrived at where we're at today. And this was, uh, like I said, the state record's 120 pounds. And I think this one was right at 140 pounds that they caught during their sampling. So they took some measurements and uh, took some information from the fish and put it back in there. So, you know, pictures like this floating around, that's why people were thinking there was gonna be a state record caught, but there's not a whole lot of those out there and, and there, it's a, there's a lot of water for anglers to try and snag that fish out of. 
Um, so the Lower Bruce, Brule Sioux Tribe, they had 25 tags, and their response rate ended up being 100%. I guess they, they said they initially sent out cards to try and get uh, responses. They had four responses out of the 25 that they sent out after a month or so, and um, they ended up calling around and getting getting all the all the responses by the end so and they harvested 10 out of the 25 uh, anglers that had tags so threats to the and this is the future of the paddlefish season on Lake Francis case threats to the paddlefish population you guys have heard a lot about this lately about the Asian carp invasion in South Dakota and this is one of the issues that we could have with these paddlefish or with these Asian carp is that they eat the same thing as a paddlefish and so if there's any competition there between those two that could negatively impact our paddlefish population in in this reservoir if those Asian carp were to get in there so that's you know a lot of this is linked with what you're hearing about these bait closures and our ANS rules and the stuff that we're trying to implement to try and keep these fish where they're at there are ramifications out there with with these other species that are important to our river and our state um, the caviar trade, they, there's been uh, regulations or regulatory um, regulations that have gone into place in, in the last couple decades that have really limited the sturgeon uh, harvest and paddlefish harvest across the globe, basically. So that ca uh, caviar trade, a lot, of that, a lot of that caviar trade may or may not be on the up and up, and so when they close some of those seasons around the globe, it always puts that, takes that pressure onto, onto seasons that, that aren't closed. And so that's one thing that we uh, want to watch and want to look out for in our paddlefish seasons and, and with our paddlefish populations is that we don't see any, any funny business with folks trying to get, uh, get at this caviar. Because this is a, um, that's a fish from a paddlefish that was right below Big Bend tailwater, and this was caught during this May season, and that fish had, uh, you know, pounds of, of eggs in it, and that's a lot of money worth of caviar right there. So it is a big business, and there are people that are, that are trying to get at this around the globe. Um, you know, other aquatic nuisance species, zebra mussels, Asian clams, those can also inhibit uh, the natural function of a, of a reservoir and, and negatively impact other fish species. So we don't know exactly how things like that would affect paddlefish populations were they to get into one of these reservoirs, but we really don't want to find out. This is Bill Harmon. He's uh, on our land crew in Chamberlain, and they, they call him the paddlefish whisperer by the end of the, the May season. He's kind of a, I guess you'd call him a river rat down there in Chamberlain. And that's, that's what I was talking about. If, if you knew the area and you knew the White River, the catch rate thing wasn't really an issue. Um, he, uh, he reported that he caught and released 35 paddlefish during the season and he harvested one. And there was one other guy that, that reported to have caught more. He, he says that he re, uh, snagged 41 paddlefish and, and then harvested one. So there was, you know, there are, the paddlefish are there and if you knew how to get to them, it was, there was still guys having a lot of success. It's not quite as easy as the Gavin's Point season and the expectation level was a little different with anglers, so. Um, I guess that's all I have. If you guys have any questions, that was kind of the quick version of the paddlefish season. I guess I'd say that from my perspective, it was a, it was a pretty big success and, and for the most part, people were pretty happy with it and I'm glad we got the opportunity to provide them with this, this opportunity and this resource that we've been working with. Excellent. You don't think they reproduce? Nope, we have never found any evidence that, we found that evidence that they try and reproduce, but they, those fish aren't recruiting into the population. Because when we go back and we do our, our sampling and we, and we capture fish for our propagation, 100% of the time the fish we capture are tagged fish, ones that we've put in there. So we've, we've never been able to establish that they're reproducing anywhere. They're trying. Yep, they, they need a big free-flowing river. They're a big river fish. There's only, a f there's only two populations of, two different species and populations of paddlefish in the world. There's some in China 
the Chinese paddlefish that have, are in these, these huge rivers in China, and there's the, this American version that, that lives in the Mississippi, the Ohio, the Missouri. So they need these huge free-flowing rivers to basically do what they do. And, and when we dam the, the Missouri River and when we dam them between two dams, they, they just can't do what they need to do. The, there are, every year there's reports in the spring of uh, the white, up the right, White River, 50, 60, 70 miles up, there's ranchers that see paddlefish out in the pools and the, in the White River behind the, you know, on their land. So they're trying to go up these streams and, and do what they need to do with what, what's there, but it just doesn't work. They would pretty much disappear. Um, you know, there may still be a remnant population because there are paddlefish up in the Dakotas and Montana and the, the, um, some of those populations may have a little bit of reproduction. And if they're still stocking fish, those fish might entrain themselves or go through the dams and make their way down, but there would not be the population that we have. Well, thank you. Thanks, Gino. Thank you.